I'm defined. Hard labor, I came here to modify the system. Take them down if they ain't listen. Straight demolition. From young, everything resisting. Good times, I don't really miss them. Gotta pay the cost, no tick. Wick, this hard labor and I'm kick. Never fit in with the crowd or got into politic. You can tell I'm built different. Trust me. It'll be a sequence of events if you touch me. Even when the women do it, love. I've been out of great people, but you'll be mistaken if you put another one above. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week in tyranny, the most hardcore news show on earth. Welcome to episode 72 of This Week in Tyranny. Today is Sunday. April 21st, 2024. And here on this episode, I've got one called something like, Where am I? What world am I living in? It's sort of a checkpoint. It's sort of just a look. Uh, halfway through 144 episodes, I want to just look at the world and analyze what's going on, look around, uh, get our bearings. What is really going on here? So, you got to start with the most important aspect of life, right? It's going to be about all the aspects of life. And the most important one to me, it's the fundamental one. Let's look at the relationship between men and women, right? This is kind of the core thing. This is how we all got here. So the family bond between romantic partners, we still have this in the world, you know, it's, it still exists. And the reason it exists is because it's a natural motivator. And boys become men when they meet a woman who looks up to them and counts on them. And that wakes up that testosterone, that that wakes up really the will to develop, to go further, to really take some action in the world. But instead, we don't have that. We have a lot less of that. Uh, You know, I'm single too. So, you know, it's not... I'm not throwing stones at glass houses, but what we have is an epidemic of loneliness. We have this in the world. And the reason we have this epidemic of loneliness, first of all, is because you have a separation of life visions. The life visions are so disconnected and almost all women associate their future with college and a career. This is why you go to any college and you see it's mostly girls walking around. Uh, And really this has become, it's so... Uh, lopsided now because the life vision of a woman is no longer safety in a man as it used to be and i'm not saying that's a bad thing right that's good the sense of independence a sense of independence is really good for men and women but this thing about it being associated with a career and an education and a degree it's an illusion of independence a college degree and a career is an illusion of independence Maybe that was not the case in the 90s, but here in the 21st century, a woman's job is her wedding ring and her husband is the state. That's how it is. Uh, and that's why you see so a lot of this toxic energy and it seems like women don't desire men. It seems like they're not grateful for men because you've we've been replaced. You've been replaced by the state and what that college degree can provide, uh, at least supposedly what it can provide. And now the vision of life for men, at the same time, has largely stayed the same. Men want the same things they've always wanted. We men want their own living space. They want to have power, and they want to be able to change and improve their environment. They want to have the toys and gadgets they like, but most importantly, they want a companion in their journey. Now the vision of life for women has changed. How has it changed? It's changed in the way that they have the man's vision. They want to have their own living space. They want to have power in society. They want to be able to change their environment. Uh, and they look for the companion. And, you know, and let's look at today's woman. Is is that the case? Or am I just talking, you know? what is today's woman career-oriented versus home-oriented? Clearly, she is, right? Finding fulfillment in worldly accomplishments as opposed to interpersonal accomplishments, as opposed to building a strong family and intimate relationships, right? And thus, because of that, it's hard for both genders to find a companion because they're, they're both occupying the same space, right? So who, who occupies now that, that space? And no, I'm not saying that every woman should cook and clean and bear children and breastfeed, okay? That's not me. There are women who are driven and can thrive and even dominate in male environments, male professions. Obviously, I've seen this. 
And to those special women, my message to you is, all that gender equality stuff is not for you. Well, what I'm saying is that it, it is a weapon against you. It will not create more of you. What it will do is it'll take down the men. And after it takes down the men, it will go after you. You will replace the men. You, you will be the strongest thing left after uh, the traditional alpha male. The strong, independent woman will be painted then as selfish, as greedy, and especially not sufficiently concerned with the others. Then you will be blamed for taking the resources and taking love away from the less fortunate women. Why do you get to have it? Why, why they don't get to have it? Why do you get to have all the praise and all the love? Right? Those are the less fortunate women who weren't blessed with your individuality, your courage, your intelligence, and your beauty. That's what's going to happen. Because it's a crabs in the barrel mentality. And it's a toxic, self-consuming sequence of events. And what puts that sequence of events into effect is education. So we're going to go from relationships now to education, to school. School is essentially the next most important aspect of life or most important aspect because, you know, out of relationships, you get children. It all starts with us being a child. So how are our children brought up? Well, first of all, they're taken away from the parents at six years old, right? They go to kindergarten, then they go to school. So the, after the basic nurturing is done, right? The hardwire programming has been done by the parents. And now the formative years begin when the habits are formed through repetition and then a mental outlook is created for the child. And what happens is they go to school and the teacher replaces the parent. They become like a stand-in substitute parent. Which is not, I'm not saying that it's an evil thing in itself, right? Other adults can take on a parental role when the parent is not there. They should do that. That's how it should be. With extended family and the community and everything. But the issue I'm talking about is... What are they teaching the children there at school? Like, what is the mental nourishment that they're being that is being given to them, right? So what do they learn? They learn first respect for the group as opposed to the individual. That that's the most basic thing you learn at school. They don't ever say that, they don't ever teach you that, but they put you into these groups and, and you raise your hand to speak. You have no power. The power is in now a group. Very simple the way that's done. And it's done on purpose. So that's one. Then you learn proficiency, but in a very narrow set environment. What environment? The office environment. School is, is essentially an office environment. It's breeding you for an office job. Right? You're sat at a desk and you're completing tasks. That kind of proficiency. But no proficiency in getting things done in the real world. In the real world, there's all this all these things that have to be done before you're sat in front of the desk to fulfill tasks if that is your chosen path but they don't teach you that and people go through school totally inept they come out completely inept when it comes to actually functioning in the real world as an adult so that's what they teach you and they also teach you details events and headlines as opposed to philosophy, as opposed to cause and effect, as opposed to meaning and purpose of the events, of the details, right? So that's school for you. It's this real surface level stuff that doesn't apply to life. And what happens after that period of long schooling, people come out incompetent and, and anxious as well. And because of you know you're anxious about your future this is how i was i dropped out of high school because i you know i couldn't take it i, I had all this you know i had no purpose i didn't know what i wanted to do and this happens to plenty of people and so most people who don't drop out most people who keep going down the path the only real solution then the only way out of that path is to work down the uh, continue down the already established path of a relationship with the state it's a lifelong perpetual school and this is what most people do they're in a lifelong school they have their degree up on the wall they're at their job and they think that there's some sort of light at the end of the tunnel there isn't uh, 
It's a lifelong relationship with the state. And to expand on this, I'm going to now bring in our quotes, what I'm going to be reading from. I'm going to quote from a person who actually made decisions like this. You know, what education would look like, what American society would look like, and what international affairs would look like. So, I'm going to read from a book by Zbigniew Brzezinski. Zbigniew Brzezinski, however you say his name, Zbig, our friend Brzezinski. He is the co-founder of the Trilateral Commission. You may have heard of it. That was founded by Jimmy Carter, Brzezinski, and David Rockefeller. So those are your three founders in 1973. And Brzezinski is a Rockefeller advisor who was a specialist on international affairs. And then later he became Jimmy Carter's national security advisor from 1977 to 1981. He was a professor at Columbia University and he left to organize the Trilateral Commission. So this guy, 1960, he's the advisor to the J John F. Kennedy campaign. Okay, 1964, he's the advisor to the Lyndon B. Johnson's campaign. 1966, he's appointed to the Policy Planning Council of the U.S. Department of State. 1968, he's the chairman of Hubert Humphrey's Foreign Policy Task Force. Now, if you haven't heard of Hubert Humphrey, it's because he lost the election. He lost that election to Ronald Reagan. And in that election, Humphrey was the globalist candidate in the 1968 election. You know, JFK was the globalist candidate in 1960. Lyndon B. Johnson was the globalist candidate in 64. And Hubert Humphrey was in 1968. And he lost. And I point that out because it doesn't mean that the globalist plan was defeated. It wasn't. Ronald Reagan was was the Donald Trump of that time period. And I make that point because now the election's coming up and so many people fall for Trump, who is actually just a much, much more inferior version of Ronald Reagan, which considering everything is actually pretty sad. That's a very sad reality that we have a mini me Ronald Reagan. And this guy is the only one saying anything sensible in today's political arena. So, Brzezinski is a perennial, perpetual policymaker, and he's a big player in global affairs. And he wrote later many of Jimmy Carter's speeches, right? He's like a man behind, he's the hidden hand behind all these presidents. And he wrote two books that to this day are like textbooks for globalism and geopolitics. He wrote The Grand Chessboard. You may have heard of that one. And then he wrote another book called Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. This is a 1982 book. You may have heard of, you may have heard this referred to as the Technotronic Era. If you've heard of that, that's this is the book that it's referring to. It's called Between Two Ages. You can still get it, but it's out of print since 1982. Um, but it's not really hidden. You can easily get it. So what does he say about education? Quoting the formal educational system has been relatively slow in exploiting the new opportunities for supplementary home-based education through television consoles and other electronic devices. It has also been suspicious of the growing inclination of non-governmental organizations to develop their own learning and training programs. In different ways, however, both the black community and business are becoming more involved in education for psychological as well as professional reasons. Greater multiplicity in educational training will make for a more pluralistic national community and the increasing involvement of business companies in education may lead a more rapid adaptation of the latest techniques and scientific knowledge to the educational process. American business and, to a lesser extent, the government, have already undertaken extensive programs of managerial retooling and retraining and thereby moving to the intermittent educational pattern. The intermittent educational patterns. So, I, I haven't heard this before. You may have not heard this, but it's, it's exactly what I mentioned. It's a perpetual school. It's a lifelong schooling pattern where you have you don't just have school and then you're let out into the corporate world you have periods of retraining where you're going to be brought back in as a student to to do some re-education and then you're going to uh, go back to your life as an adult uh, in your profession so 
uh, and let's I want to pull on this string more but before I do it he told you all the way back then this is 1982 he told you about learning through television home-based education through television consoles so uh, this is 42 years ago you know this is already going on and we're not talking about PBS kids we're talking about the things that kids are watching on YouTube on TikTok education is already there and the way we know it's already there this so-called education is because it's not just government it's non-governmental organizations developing their own learning and training programs meaning who who could that be that could be the United Nations uh, that could be Amazon right these big companies Amazon Google you you don't think they're training uh, their future workers as well as their future customer base that's what we're talking about here with with the educational system he's talking about the formal educational system he's he's talking about it and and this is the educational system that's of the past this is gone now and they're moving to the intermittent educational pattern and in my view it's already here it's just going to develop more and unravel more so what does he mean by intermittent educational pattern let's talk about that i already talked about the women being married to the state and i talked about their vision of life being a college and a career so let's prove whether or not that's the case and since i've said that this vision of life is traditionally the male vision of life we're talking about the entire young adult population now okay so back to the book a good case can be made for ending initial education more of which could be obtained in the home through electronic devices somewhere around the age of 18. this formal initial period could be followed by two years of service in a socially desirable cause then by direct involvement in some professional activity and by advanced systematic training within that area and finally by regular periods of one and eventually even two years of broadening integrative study at the beginning of every decade of one's life somewhere up to the age of 60 for example medical or legal training could begin after only two years of college thus both shortening the time needed to complete the training and probably also increasing the number attracted into these professions regular and formally required retraining as well as broadening could ensue at regular intervals throughout most of one's professional career so clearly stated this is the plan for a lifelong relationship with the state when he talks about ending school at the age of 18 he doesn't just mean high school it will be high school and college like at the age of 18 school is basically done and then what does he say two years of service that two years of service is actually one of the most insidious dangerous plans ever this is huge red flags okay people don't get this but that two years of service is is the worst it, that's hitler youth that's leninist and stalinist youth whenever the state proposes for young people to go into the service of society that's when you know you're very close to the state having absolute power and basically having a whole social class a whole group of people a, a buffer class that can be used for violent dictatorship when you have young people going into some sort of social service and that's the thing you do like going into the military you're very close to that to genocide and you know check check history for that you only got to go back a hundred years you got multiple examples young people they need to be in service to themselves out of the teenage years and throughout the 20s a person's body mind and heart is telling them to serve themselves you're supposed to serve yourself at this time that is the correct thing to do at that stage of life you're never going to have more energy you're never going to have more optimism and you will never have more freedom to make mistakes than in your early 20s you're supposed to make mistakes to learn from and you're supposed to chase dreams and take your teenage idealism and convert that idealism into real world action and test the limits of the world of what you can get done service to self it's like such a, everybody says that is a bad thing it's not and and no self-service is not some sort of ultimate transcendent goal that's going to create utopia but in a human being's natural blueprint it's there uh, we have a natural blueprint like 
first. You worry about yourself when you're young. This is what kids do. They start off thinking they're the whole world. You're supposed to do that. Then you go and explore the world. When you go and explore the world, then you go get older and you grow up and you take on personal missions and journeys, right? You're, you're very explorative and then you find love then you look for love when you know when you mature and and we're not talking about agape love we're talking about selfish romantic love right you do that and then you have children obviously as a natural uh, effect of looking for love and finding it then you have children and having children is what teaches you to care for the world as a whole right and investing in the future that's this is the natural way to do that and having that entire rich life experience that you've already had we have the information and we have the wisdom and we have the motivation to act correctly in the world and that's how it's done and that's not to say everybody has to follow that natural blueprint but you start off with service to self and then you learn from it okay and the intermittent educational model it cuts this process off right cuts that blueprint down cuts the tree at the base and pours a big fucking six inch concrete slab all over it and it's not because it's bad to care about poverty or equality or equal rights or animal rights right that's part of being young and strong too is to speak up for the powerless the defenseless the underdogs but when it's sanctioned by the state organized by think tanks and funded by multinational corporations not only does it help does it not help the people that you want to help it wastes your time it squanders your youthful spirit and worst of all it deprives you of the ability to formulate your own worldview it gives you a chaotic worldview full of struggle and go 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 activism you know picket signs go go help them go save the world and you get swept up into these movements and you never get the chance to analyze a record of your own personal actions and the effects of those actions and that's how a person discovers morality a universal objective morality that's how it's done through the effects of your selfish actions okay and i'm stressing this this point because I'm tired of these damn progressives and wokeists claiming some sort of moral high ground. And what they do is they draw actually good, loving, passionate, valuable, productive young people into their dogmatic ideologies. No, the moral high ground is not out there in food drives, in, in mutual aid, or helping the homeless. The moral high ground is in giving those people some real power. Give them some real fucking power. That's what these people need. The disadvantaged, the disabled, the forgotten, the marginalized. They first and foremost need to believe in themselves, care for themselves. And the way to self-care and self-belief is cultivated through action taken, will exerted and real world power obtained. And the way to get power over into these communities, into these people's hands, is to disempower the groups and institutions that have a vested interest in keeping the bottom of society at the bottom of society which is the government the think tanks the bureaucracy the big corporations the predatory dystopian so-called philanthropists the drug cartels and the vaccine pushers disempower them and then the, the, then the homeless people then the poor people then the trans people they will all have more power they will be in a better position that's what you have to do here and one of this week's stories that contributed to me stressing this, making this a focal point, is the pro-Palestinian protests over at Columbia University in New York, and over a hundred of them being arrested. Students got arrested, they were barred from returning to the campus, they were just sitting at tables, and they, they were arrested there, they were not breaking any rules, total tyranny, right? So what did I do? I listened to what the protesters said right they were there and justice was done to them so what did they say so first i'll remind you what i said about modern student activist organizations their movements and my problem with them sanctioned by the state organized by think tanks and funded by multinational corporations so let's see if that's true i'm going to read this op-ed piece in the columbia spectator right college newspaper 
written by the Columbia University Apartheid Divest, the organization. The Columbia University Apartheid Divas is a coalition of student organizations that see Palestine as the vanguard for our collective liberation. We are a continuation of the Vietnam anti-war movement and the movement to divest from apartheid South Africa. We support freedom and justice for the Palestinian people and for all people. We know that true collective safety will arrive when everyone has access to clean air, clean water, food, housing, education, health care, freedom of movement, and dignity. Those things they stated at the end does not government, do not influential international organizations, and the corporate world align with those code words. They're slogans, really. And I'll break down the slogans, clean air and clean water. What, what does that mean? That means harsh federal regulations, which means, wink, wink, it means harsh federal regulations against small, uh, small business, on small businesses, not big corporations, because big corporations, they have the resources and the connections to influence the federal bureaucrats to turn a blind eye over to them. And they pass the regulations and your family business gets destroyed by the regulations that's what happened during the pandemic target doesn't give a fuck about the mask requirements or or them you know cleaning every counter every two seconds spraying hand sanitizer stands all these stickers on the floor they could do that you as a small business don't have the resources to do that because you got two people manning manning you know the whole store two registers food uh, food means what it means welfare universal basic income how else are you going to guarantee everybody food? It means a fail-safe, reliable, perpetual social class of political support. That's why they're all, they're all about giving everybody food. It's not because they actually want to solve poverty. It's, it allows anybody who can achieve it, right? who can achieve guaranteed food for everybody, it gives them the political base to stay in power indefinitely. Because the poor and dependent they are then in a position where they will always attack the political opponents of the people feeding them like their life depends on it because it will their life will depend on it that's why that's a problem okay nobody's for poverty but, but you got to see the game being played housing next one housing means what it means united nations sustainable development agenda it means mixed use dwellings and I talked about it so many times, it's what I covered earlier this month, and I called it the housing racketeering scam. That's what it is. Education, we just talked about. Healthcare. You know, healthcare is, is an extension of food. It's an assurance of the most fundamental things, a person's well-being. And the problem is, when your health is dependent on somebody, they are the ones who set the terms of your health care. And therefore, they set the terms of your medicinal and nutritional intake, which means they control your body, which means they essentially control your life. Then freedom of movement. That means open borders. They're saying open borders, which I actually agree with. Most people don't. What I don't agree with is tax-sponsored relocation. I don't agree with false promises made to desperate people. And I for damn sure don't agree with equipping women and children with boxes of, of candy bars to walk up and down the street in traffic, playing on guilt and pity as a means of income. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, that's what it's like in Chicago. I'm not sure how it is near you. And that gets on my nerves, you know, paying, for an, paying with an inflated devalued currency for a processed toxic piece of candy to do what? To endorse the woman doing the same thing tomorrow. For her child to grow up uh, on a sling on the woman's back to a river of taillights and gray faces. That's not help. These people need real help. They need to be taught English and they need to be taught skills. They don't need to be shipped over to Home Depot to stand there all day and be babysat by a cop or a security guard. That's bullshit. And last word they use, last but not least, dignity. Well, dignity, I take that word very seriously. And I'm the type that is going to kill and die for my dignity, no problem, at the drop of a hat. But what it means here, when, when the student group lists it, it's being listed last here because it's a placeholder. In, in this sentence, dignity means etc. It means dot, dot, dot. It means 
any other social justice cause, any other social engineering cause that we haven't thought of yet. We will put in dignity to signify that. And this is who is putting the battery in the back of these Columbia students. And they say, we are committed to creating a multi-generational, intersectional, and accessible space dedicated to fighting for abolition, transnational feminism, anti-capitalism, and decolonization, and also to combating anti-blackness, queer phobia, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. And they actually say they're a direct descendant of the anti-Vietnam War movement, which is so interesting to me because it's almost like it's an homage to Brzezinski. It's, it's almost like a joke because there's a section in this book between two ages where he talks exactly about the Vietnam War movement. Uh, the, I mean, the uh, Vietnam War anti-war protesters, student protesters. That's in a section called infantile ideology. And, you know, Brzezinski, as I've said, was, of course, he lectured at Columbia for several years until he was taken to be a political advisor. And he talks in this book about their mentality and how they can be used as a tool for change. And is that now what's going on today? This is a section called historical discontinuity. In our time, the student generation represents one of the most dynamic variables of change. The growth in their number, as well as the simultaneous growth in the number of radios, televisions, and telephones. All items that affect personal relationships, both making it possible and encouraging the rapid dissemination of ideas, make for a subjectively dynamic mood that stands in sharp contrast to the relatively slower rate of change in such items as income, the switch from rural to urban employment, the population shift to larger urban centers, or the average number of people living in a room. The overall result is the contradiction, already noted in the preceding chapter, between the pace of change in the state of mind and in material reality. In the words of a student of modernization, contemporary man, and this is especially true of the younger generation, is less under the domination of his environment, and to this extent he is freer, but at the same time, he is less certain of his purpose, and in times of great unrest he is prepared to surrender his freedom in the interest of purposeful leadership. So I know that's a lot of reading. He writes in a difficult way. I think it's easier to see it, right? I should have put it on the screen. But he's talking about these college students coming out with a anxiety and a split between mind and body. And this is the result of that period of long schooling and the ideas that are spread through social media, which, by the way, was not there when this book was written. But he wrote there, talking about radio and television, that these technological items would make ideas spread instantaneously. And when ideas are spread instantaneously to these students, there is a sense of anxiety because the ideas that they're being presented with are not being implemented. So they're being taught abstractions, but not reality. And they don't know how to turn the abstractions into reality. And in that anxious state, they are willing to trade freedom for purposeful leadership. So in the end they're in the same boat as the demographics and the groups and the nations that they want to help they're actually not in a position to help because they don't have the knowledge and philosophical framework to explain the situation to someone and show them how to fundamentally change their situation it's a very stressful situation to be in so we'll leave the college years there right we already talked about relationships we already talked about children and then adulthood hits and we all face the same obstacle which is making enough money to secure some sort of a good life for us and our family now i won't talk about the federal reserve and banking central banking itself being a scam you could watch money masters or you could watch the creature from G uh, creature from jekyll island for that what i'm concerned with is the current trend and future outlook what's going on prices are steadily increasing year by year so there's a clear economic decline that's one and two there are disruptions in the supply chain meaning there's no longer an airtight assurance that any transaction will go down as planned that products will be delivered as promised and that services will be rendered in a way that is satisfactory so you've got a systematic downward change and you've also got an uncertainty so you've got a split again the result is again anxiety 
or as Brzezinski calls it, discontinuity. And our brains don't like discontinuity, so we seek what? Purposeful leadership, or really, anything that can provide a sense of cohesion and safety. And this is the reason for us having economic uncertainty, every few years it seems, and especially right now, because this is a long-term strategy to take economic power out of the hands of the individual and into the hands of the state. So is that ever set out, said in the open though? Let's see. Quoting again, economic power in the early phase of industrialization tends to be personalized by either entrepreneurs like Henry Ford or bureaucratic industrial, in, bureaucratic industrial officials like Kognovich or mine in Stalinist Poland. The tendency towards depersonalization of economic power is stimulated in the next stage by the appearance of a highly complex interdependence between governmental institutions, including the military, scientific establishments, and industrial organizations. As economic power becomes inseparably linked with political power, it becomes more invisible, and the sense of individual futility increases. So it, it's really a two-part paragraph. Okay, He talks about in industrialization, economic power is highly personalized. So he's saying that in the, after the Industrial Revolution, right, in the time period, 1800s, 1900s, up to recent times, people had the most power. Individuals could change their life. They had the most power. And what you get is this, what he calls, highly complex interdependence between you know, government, science, and, and industry. He's describing the occult web of control. It's, it's actually stated out in the openly here. It's stated out in the open. Um, and that really is, that is what is developing now. So as opposed to the industrial time, you've got this kind of interdependence. You've got this new underground oligarchy. And what happens is with that, you get individual futility, which is indeed the goal. And Brzezinski and the technocrats, they actually don't want to keep the state, keep the people in the state of futility, right? They, they don't actually want this long term, as communist regimes have done throughout history. You know, communism and socialism keeps the people in, in like this state of futility. They know that things are bad. They know it's not going to get any better. The people in China, the, the people in the Soviet Union, the people in North Korea, they don't actually believe the things their leaders are saying. They know they know that you know there's, there's a sense of futility there that's why there's always grayness that's why you see no art or music or inventions coming out of socialist nations ever so the technocrats though they want to create the sense of futility and then lead the people out of it through environmental control through food control through surveillance through tracking and through social credit and at the end of the day it's all about money but not money per se but resources resources are linked to property and energy and energy is only a measure of will right who is sacrificing what resources that's why that's all the technocrats talk about they talk so much about energy and resources the united nations talk about energy and resources because energy resources knowledge and skills control the world that's all it comes down to and these people know it and you don't long show it's action-packed so these people know it you don't and not just energy and power energy as in power and electricity but energy as in will we're talking about will here and even if you have zero resources you have zero knowledge you have zero skills still if a person doesn't want to do something you can't make them do it it's all about will right it, it makes the world go round and the most powerful technocrat in the world cannot do anything about it even if the biggest idiot in the world doesn't want to do something they lose it's what can you make people do and i say that to take us into the next section the next aspect of life that needs to be talked about it's politics and really political will which doesn't mean voting or laws it just means what the people believe what people think what people feel because that's what determines what they actually do and it's actually a key crisis 
because politics have become so heated in the past 10 years or so that it divides men and women again relationships because these super modern super leftist modern ideologies make it very difficult to have a romantic relationship especially if the woman is is the super liberal one and she wants to be with a man why because a relationship requires respect and humility it requires compromise for the man and the woman and it's so night and day from what the ideologies of progressivism and modernism are right where there is a dogmatic militancy it bulldozes all who disagree right all who who speak out against it and demands total agreement and total unification and a man can't live like that is the point a man needs the breathing room to be a man he needs to stretch his legs out a little and a woman can't live like that either she she won't be fully happy with a man that takes orders from a social engineering program she doesn't want a man who's soft she wants a man who focuses on her and him and by the way I'm not mentioning same-sex couples not because I disapprove of your lifestyle but because in the grand scheme of things you are not in the game you're, you're not really involved yes you are treated unfairly the gays the lesbians the trans people you're treated unfairly both by the bulk of society who will never really understand you and by the progressives who want to wipe your ass for you they're really hurting you in the grand scheme of things but the reality is when we talk about power and societal change and all of this you're not really on the chessboard okay and as cold as i sound i personally care deeply about disadvantaged individuals otherwise i wouldn't do the show the innocent the defenseless people who are hurt injured traumatized and the other ethnicities and the other orientations and cultures and and black men especially you know it it's through black musicians and athletes and black philosophers that i really became inspired in life when i was like sixth seventh eighth grade it, that's what drove me to become what i am today that's where i found inspiration that's where i found a father figure really at the time where i didn't uh, didn't have one so relationships are split families are split you know how many families have totally fell apart since the pandemic anybody that sees the truth about the vaccine is ostracized by the rest of the family right how many friends and neighbors no longer meet and they no longer talk to each other because one of them recognizes that the world is being tricked and scammed so they turn conservative how often does that happen you know and of course this works the other way too this is where a young liberal person gets ignored and alienated by their conservative family creating a generational divide and cutting the lines of trust and communication and it hurts both of them because it, she can be tricked now and the family cannot pass their knowledge so, so they're both gonna lose brzezinski wrote about all this and more the newly enfranchised masses are organized in the industrial society by trade unions and political parties and unified by relatively simple and somewhat ideological programs moreover political attitudes are influenced by appeals to nationalist sentiments communicated through the massive increase of newspapers employing naturally the reader's national language in the technotronic society the trend seems to be towards aggregating the individual support of millions of unorganized citizens who are easily within the reach of magnetic and attractive personalities and effectively exploiting the latest communication techniques to manipulate emotions and control reason reliance on television and hence the tendency to replace language with imagery which is international rather than national and to include war coverage or scenes of hunger in places as distant as for example india creates a somewhat more cosmopolitan though highly impressionistic involvement in global affairs there's a lot said there i'm going to go through that like three different ways they they foresee very vivid right images controlling people's emotions like war coverage in distant places like palestine like ukraine like creating what a, a somewhat more cosmopolitan cosmopolitan meaning what meaning you think you understand the whole world right it means 
having to do with the whole world. Uh, though highly impressionistic means means based on your impressions, based on your emotions, that kind of an involvement in global affairs. It's the kind of involvement where because you see it, you think it's close to you, you think you understand it. So then there, there's some sort of involvement. You're going to call for action. You're going to call for funding. You're going to call for... Uh, like the Columbia student group for you know divesting from apartheid right and, and when they, when they say cosmopolitan though impressionistic Brzezinski's mocking them and and I actually enjoyed this a bit and he actually said in the first part employing naturally the reader's national language now that's hilarious to me you know simple ideological programs the national language and I'll actually talk about that national language what does he mean right because it's actually two, he talked about two things again, two halves. He talked about the old conservative and the new liberal. So the first half he's talking about industrial society. Uh, he's talking about the reader's national language, which is, which is what? What is, what is the appeal to nationalism? America first, border invasion, does that sound familiar? Flooding the streets with fentanyl. Oh, my favorite one, military age men. Anybody that says military age men, you're you're in the programming. You know what what does that mean, military age men? You know you you're thinking about a whole group of people as a combatant, and it's not that they won't be dangerous, but the real danger is in the people bringing them, right? So they're speaking your national language, your patriotic language, like oh, America, you know, patriotism, whatever country it is, doesn't matter if it's America or, or Germany or Russia appeals to nationalism it appeals to you know that's half the country that's usually the, the old school half and then you have the second half of that paragraph you've got your technocratic society that he's talking talking about and specifically appealing to uh to uh, millions of unorganized citizens through magnetic attractive personalities not exactly joe biden but yes barack obama and his presidency, if you think about it, did kick off this modern progressivism. You know, change. Yes, we can. These idealist slogans, and especially the political fervency and involvement of women. Who brought women to, to be so fierce and outspoken in the political world than Barack Obama? And, you know, a hey, tall, dark, and handsome, right? I hope you can see the game being played. That's how it's played. And now with Joe Biden, we have a lull, right? Not exactly charismatic. And this too is intentional. Because when the next Democrat candidate comes around, the next Democrat president, he's going to be like Kennedy. And all the progressives are being starved for charisma. They're going to be swept off their feet. You know, it's like when your girl leaves town and you miss her, you haven't seen her for a month. And then you finally meet, she comes back and you see her. And finally she comes back, you know, it's going to be beautiful and magical and explosive. That's how it goes. And, and people don't understand politics, laws, domestic policy, foreign policy. It's all about the inner world. It's about the emotional, the intimate. I keep talking about global government, government that's going to take on the role, psychologically take on the role of a mother, fulfilling the role of the mother. And you can even say, see that in the two ages Brzezinski talks about. The industrial age, which is what? Industry. Induction. It's a upward industrious movement. It erects big smokestacks and factories and skyscrapers, right? It, it reflected, you know, coming out of centuries of physical repression, being held down and worked in the fields. And the, what happens? The great men come along and they bring material freedom. Is that not a very masculine thing, you know? And now is the time for the great woman. We're, we're enter it's the age of Aquarius, right? So emotional freedom now is lagging behind the material freedom. So we should be entering the natural age. Healing trauma, unschooling, you, you know, taking kids out of schools, having children make more decisions, organic food, reducing our dependence on animal products, right? Art, music, creativity. This is the age we should be entering. And the technocratic age now, the, the technotronic age, as Brzezinski calls it, it twists this. As opposed to induction, it's the age of deduction. 
it's all the resources in one place, all the energy in one place, all the control in a single system, all distributed to the people downwards like breast milk, like breast milk, like nourishment, like care. Global government is a big universal titty for the babies to suck on. Could I make that any more clear? It's so simple. And it's all about the emotional, and Brzezinski talks plenty about that. As two observers sympathetic to the new radical movements explain that the contemporary rebels think that the ivory-towered men of ideas have cheated them, lied to them, and that action and spontaneous experience will show them the truth. From this attitude is derived the view that reason by itself is suspect, and it must be buttressed by emotion, and that if a choice has to be made, emotion is a better guide than reason. Seeing in the world around them both hypocrisy and the failure of reason, with reason in the surface of evil, which makes it either a slave of ideology or employs it as a scientific tool to improve war-making efficiency, even moderate dissenters condemned contemporary liberals for their lack of passion. In cold reason, they saw more than a mere absence of moral indignation, a commitment to the status quo, a willingness to effect only marginal change, and a determination to avoid confronting the more basic moral issues. Reliance on passion and action had the added advantage of not requiring a programmatic blueprint. In contrast, the old ideologies offered both a critique of the present and a blueprint for the future, thus opening themselves to criticism on the level of both practicality, is their utopia attainable, and performance, why hasn't the utopia been achieved? The politics of ecstasy do not require a program to generate action, and their adherents were therefore not greatly troubled by the patronizing criticism of their programmatic vacuity advanced from the socialist old left and from the established communist parties. On the contrary, they argued that it is not through institutional reforms spelled out in the programs, but through the creation of a community of emotion that true freedom can be attained. There's a lot there. But that's 24 wokeism broken down for you in 1982 because it's actually not that new it, it's the politics of ecstasy great phrase it's the idea that your feelings guide your actions you know reliance on passion you need both emotion and thought to have power and what we have today is a split of the two we have dull lifeless conservatives and reactionary snowflake soft ass liberals and this is a very important passage here. And he notes that when you can whip somebody into an emotional frenzy, it does not matter what they believe. He says that it not requiring a programmatic blueprint. There is no programming blueprint required because it is easy to steer an emotional group always because what appeals to emotions are simple solutions, easy to understand, easy keywords, repetitive phrases. And who does that? That's what politicians do. And today we have this emotion action disconnect. And there are so many intelligence and subversion tactics that are launched in this area. And I'll talk about them. There are numerous movements that are controlled opposition and they're psyop missions. They're, they're fake false movements that people are uh, seduced into. One, modern stoicism and not showing any emotions, facing any hardship with a straight face. It takes all the worst parts of stoicism and exalts them acceptance lack of action not displaying anger and not expressing suffering and not therefore not inspiring others to act and it leaves behind the best part of stoicism which is the christ-like acceptance of a long difficult mission to actually be in the game week after week and carry the mission forward with a straight face that's real stoicism that's one then you got the q movement naive fantasizing about change refusing to accept the fact that we are operating from a losing position we're losing we don't have help in high places there is no process to trust and the q movement is just another movement that targets men and gets them to be passive and never involve any emotion then you get migtau men going their own way and this modern day self-improvement sigma male movements Again, channeling men's frustration and anger and their loneliness, channeling that into blaming women. A materialistic outlook on life where women are seen as simple animals who just go for the richest, most attractive man. It's just another repression of emotion and an acceptance of today's dynamic as being just the way it is. 
And also you have your fitness and gym culture, which is another redirection of energy into just physical release of emotions, working on your body and perfecting it, spending hours and hours and hours on nutrition and exercise, which then becomes a substitute for your mental and spiritual inner work. And on the other hand, you've got the new age, which is spiritual inner work without any physical action or mental action. Right? Quiet your mind. Right? Empty your thoughts. That's modern Taoism for you too. That's another cul-de-sac. Another time-wasting trap. Spending hours and hours and hours of meditating, working on yourself, but hardly any time working on others to influence them, to build relationships with them. To have power, thoughts and emotions have to go together and they have to create action. And he tells you that in the last paragraph of Brzezinski's book, this is how he finishes it. But whatever the future may actually hold for America and for the world, the technotronic age, by making so much more technologically feasible and electronically accessible, make deliberate choice about more issues more imperative reason belief and values were inter interact intensely putting a greater premium than ever before on the explicit definition of social purposes to what ends should our power be directed how should our social dialogue be promoted in what way should the needed action be taken these are both philosophical and political issues in the technotronic era philosophy and politics will be crucial and you have to kind of translate what he says because philosophy just means thought and emotion it means your framework of of seeing the world and politics doesn't mean voting politics means action poly is plural right politics means the people it means he, he's telling you it's about what we do what do you actually do and that should be the question we ask ourselves what are we actually doing in the technotronic era because we're in it and this is the thing this guy Brzezinski he tells you the truth and I'm actually grateful for people like this you know Brzezinski is a million times better than someone like Bill Gates and this is somebody I've known about for over 15 years right since I started looking into alternative stuff I knew about Brzezinski and his book and I thought I hated him and some people say like he's a great Polish man he's a great Polish person in history and it's just a joke like just because you met the Pope and because you were against the Soviet Union in the Cold War era you're supposed to be some great Polish person it's a joke but I thought I hated him but then as I did the show, there's something I like about the technocrats. There's something I really like about Brzezinski and these guys, Howard Scott. They tell you the truth. They actually tell you the truth as long as you speak their language. So, so you have to respect him. And here's, here's what he said. This is what I'll finish it with. Today we are again witnessing the emergence of transnational elites. But now they are composed of international businessmen, scholars, professional men, and public officials. The ties of these new elites cut across national boundaries. Their perspectives are not confined by national traditions, and their interests are more, more functional than national. These global communities are gaining in strength, and as was true in the Middle Ages, it is likely that before long, the social elites of most of the more advanced countries will be highly internationalist or globalist in spirit and outlook. The creation of the global information grid, facilitating almost continuous intellectual interaction and the pooling of knowledge, will further enhance the present trend towards international professional elites and toward the emergence of a common scientific language, in effect, the functional equivalent of Latin. That's that honesty I'm talking about, right? Transnational elites, you know? The conspiracy movement couldn't have come up with that phrase, you know? But I wanna end the show with the two main takeaways of that passage. And they contain the main idea and the solution. One, we are in the transition to transnational elites, meaning that it is the influences and the abilities of someone that determines their position in the hierarchy of power. Not heredity, not born into it, not like it used to be, not royal families, not necessarily who has the biggest army 
or who has the most money or the most resources and it's not even who has the most advanced technology it, it, the ruling class what they're doing is implementing a meritocracy within their own ranks see they've tested this out in the world in multiple ways right the the tests have come back the science is in trust the science but socialism and communism doesn't work as a system despotism doesn't work competition works free market works and what technocracy seeks to do is to essentially implement capitalism a form of capitalism for the elites capitalism for them socialism for us that's how they assure their victory but not capitalism as in money because their currency is not money their currency is influence whoever has the right connections whoever can pull the right strings on the web of control whoever can exert the proper influence will sit on the throne that's how it assures that they will be successful and they will keep moving forward and not be inbred and fucking retarded and backwards the way leaders of of past times have been and this brings us to point number two toward the emergence of a common scientific language and that's why i read from this book and that's actually what this week in tyranny is all about plans for the world and the truth about the world are being discussed openly you just have to know the language you have to be able to see it you have to be able to analyze it you have to know where to look for it you have to understand the phrases what they mean you have to understand the language of symbolism as well and to see emotional manipulation when it appears it's just language and really both the solution to tyranny and the reason for for how we got into tyranny in the first place is language how well do you speak how clearly can you communicate those are the things that determine your position in the world essentially in the past and, and especially moving forward into the future and this is how man was tricked into living contrary to his own nature from the beginnings right from the garden of eden or from you know the beginnings of language if you're the evolution type he was swindled people were swindled people were sweet talked people were serenaded into a fetal position with no power that's what has happened with the world and our redemption begins with the word and the weapon of the war for our liberation is language and that's why in latin the word free and the word book are the same word it's liber that's where you get liberation from liberty and library are almost the same word and lips and labia same thing the mouth means speech right so free speech is really a redundant phrase it's saying the same thing twice because there is no speech without freedom and there for damn sure is no freedom without speech and that's it that's my appeal to everybody to stand up speak up learn the language fuck these bitches F fuck these bitches trying to take our world over it's my world it's my money and i need it now that's my message so thank you very much for your time and i'll see you next week on this week in tyranny in this tournament the chosen few shall be triumphant and the devil will be decapitated so you can keep your ducats and your dresses i won't be emasculated, emasculated. in this world of science